listening to Digital Now, an original business and technology podcast by Logic 2020. I'm your host, Matt Treville. Each episode, I'll be interviewing a new expert to learn more about industry trends, fascinating new tech, shifting customer expectations, and the steps every business can take to stay ahead. Today, we're going to be talking about supply chain resiliency. And with me, I have a very special guest, Elaine Co, who has spent the last 18 years of her career working in supply chain management and operations, studied at Northwestern and MIT, and has always had a professional and personal interest in supply chain management. Sort of, you've always had that curiosity sort of to peek behind the curtains. Is that right, Elaine? Yeah, that's right, Matt. I always was interested. I was always fascinated by the little things like how, you know, how products ended up on the shelf, how um, my Uber driver like knows where to find me. Yeah. You know, I always thought it was just like not taking for granted things that we tend to take for granted. Exactly. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So that's fantastic. So first things first, how are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. It's sunny here in San Francisco. Um, I'm excited to be here and, and talking about supply chain resiliency. So thanks for having me. Oh, no worries at all. How, be, how about we get straight into it? What do you think? Because this is a very interesting topic. So I'm, I'm ready to get in. Okay, let's do it. Okay, question number one for you. First things first, what is supply chain resiliency? And then where is it being used today? Yeah, so I'm actually going to start with what is supply chain management. Um, so, you know, really that is a discipline around anything that goes into managing the flow of goods and services. And as you can imagine, it's, it's a pretty broad topic. Typically, when people talk about supply chain management, they talk about um, sourcing of raw materials, uh, managing defects on a manufacturing line, optimizing a distribution network. So it, it's really just everything that's involved with getting people the things they want when they want it. Um, and as you can imagine, just this whole field has gone extremely complicated with globalization and just evolving needs as far as you know, when we expect things, you know, with I have I have Amazon Prime, I expect things the next day. I have my phone. There's pretty much nothing I can't have delivered within an hour. <laughs> yeah. We've become so impatient now <laughs> with everything. Totally, totally. So there's just a heightened um, customer expectation and then just like the types of goods and services we want have changed. So, you know, I think the field itself has changed a lot and supply chain resiliency is no exception. Um, it's really about how businesses can develop processes in order to address unexpected events. And so, you know, right now we're living in a pandemic. This was not expected and it's had some major implications to our daily lives and, and then also the goods and services that we get. Um, and, you know, unfortunately we're seeing just a lot of natural disasters happen and that's become a common occurrence. We have the wildfires in California every year. Right now, <clears throat> the folks in Austin are doing dealing with a major power outage because of winter storms. So, you know, it is just part of now the equation that people need to think about when they consider their supply chain operations. So you, you, you have to imagine then that supply chain resiliency is being used everywhere because those sorts of events can, can take out entire industries, right? Or at least affect them greatly. So. Very interesting. And I know you mentioned COVID. So I just I just want to touch on that a little bit because it is sort of controlling our world today. So why does that make supply chain resiliency important? And what is different? Can you can you dig a little bit deeper into why it's different now with COVID? Yeah, so, you know, I was studying supply chain resiliency over a decade ago, and it was more localized events. So um, Yossi Sheffi, he's a, a thought leader in this area. He's the director at MIT. And a lot of it was around supply disruption. So, you know, you could have a tsunami in Southeast Asia and you can't get supply out. Or it's very specific. Um, and it's very specific, whereas now you're dealing with a pandemic that's global. So not only is it impacting your global su your supply piece of the equation, but it's also impacting demand at this point. Like usually consumer demand doesn't shift as drastically, but we've been living with this pandemic for over a year. So for instance, I 
now have a closet full of toilet paper and perishable <laughs> goods, which I never had before, yeah. right? Yeah. A wine <laughs> subscription and a, a bar cart because I want to make sure that I will have the things that I want when I want them. And businesses are having to struggle with that as well. So, you know, not only there's so much uncertainty in the supply piece of the equation, but then also like what people want and and that changing dynamic there. So it, it's just, a, it's a very unique and interesting um, situation now where a lot of supply chain principles are are dependent on being able to predict both the supply and the demand side. And right now it's 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 very unpredictable. So I think the toilet paper example is a perfect one because I think it affected most people on the planet, it seems like, at one point during this pandemic. So uh, very interesting here that that's, uh, that's part of it. So, um, so what does it mean to be supply chain resilient then? Well, I think at a broad level, it's rethinking your overall strategy. So as I mentioned, I'm rethinking my strategy in my personal life businesses have to do the same. So, um, you know, as an example, it's always been a trade-off between cost and customer service. And on the cost side, you have a lot of different factors. Um, you know, you can reduce your safety stock. You can go to a single supplier versus multiple suppliers. You can have one distribution center versus three. And now it's like, although that can keep your costs down, there is just a lot of vulnerability if something unexpected happens. So it's really rethinking, you know, what what decisions can you make that balance your short term gain with like managing long term risk. Interesting, because I mean, I like I like how you brought it back to a personal level, because any everyone can understand that, right? We have to change the way we do things if something gets in the way of that process. So it's interesting to hear businesses are no different, right? It's just to a much larger scale. Right. That's pretty cool. Okay, so question number four I've got for you here. Um, how to live with risks if the cost of flexibility is too great? Oh, I love this question. So, you know, it's just not reasonable for people to build so much flexibility in their supply chain. It's just extremely cost prohibited. Um, you know, you, you can't have five manufacturing locations. And especially if, you know, you're a smaller company with less capital, you, you can't build in that flexibility. Um, so there's tools out there where you can predict if something is going to happen or you can get early warning signs. Um, so I compare this to like a social media feed, right? So like if there's something important going on, like I check my Twitter or my Reddit or my next door, I get next door alerts just because I want to know something in advance of it hitting mainstream media. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's um, what I think some businesses can do. Um, as an example, there's a software company out there called Brazil Inc. And um, what they did was they actually had monitoring systems in place so they knew that something was happening in Wuhan back in December and they set up a geofence. They notified all their customers that were at risk there and those customers could then take action, whether it be getting their inventory out, finding alternate suppliers. So it's all about having that advance warning. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us would make different decisions a year ago if we would have known where we're, where we're at today, right? Oh, 100%, yeah. Yeah, so I think that, and that is actually probably a more feasible approach for for most companies, um, is, is really developing a way to trigger a warning that something's happening and then having, you know, kind of backup processes so you can easily shift the way you do business to adapt to the changing environment. So that flexibility, does that, um, you know, I guess, what are the major trends around that now, right? As people are trying to become more flexible, are we seeing trends in the industry and with companies? Absolutely. And it's a pretty cool time. Um, you know, I know it's really chaotic and it can be very stressful, but a lot of companies are um, doing some really cool things. Um, AI has always been a hot topic, but 
I think this has given an opportunity for businesses to focus more on their AI. So not only their predictive but prescriptive analytics, like predicting what's going to happen and then predicting the strategies you can put in place and how effective those strategies are going to be. Um, digital transformation, so building out your e-commerce platform. We have curbside pickup here now for stores so people don't go in and, and risk the spread of COVID. Um, some businesses have even taken it a step further where they're being really innovative about recreating that brick and mortar experience. Um, as an example, with Ikea, you can upload a picture of your living room and you can put in the furniture pieces so you can see what it looks like in real time, yeah. um, which is, is cool. Like I actually personally hate going to Ikea, so I would match better <laughs> that. Um, so Good time to mention our sponsor, Ikea Furniture. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to think of a new sponsor. <laughs> So, well, now should we do? I mean, th what they're doing is great, and no, I know. <laughs> it's best for it's best for both. You know, it's best for the consumer and um, and the company. Um, another example is Sephora. So they, you know, what I love about Sephora is you can go in there, you can test their products. I can see what shade of lipstick looks best on me. And now, since I don't have that experience, they have what they call virtual artist. So I can upload a picture of myself and I can actually try on five different shades of red lipstick instead of wow. store. So, you know, I think that's something that's really cool that's happening. Um, and I think the pandemic has certainly propelled businesses to move in these directions. Um, another big focus area is around the last mile. So you'll hear this a lot. So the last mile is really the last leg between a hub and when the consumer gets the product or service. And it's it's hard to really um, make sure that's a seamless experience, but it's so important to the overall customer satisfaction. Um, and it, it's like it's like what the, the customer sees the most. It's at that end they get what they want. Ah. Yeah. And so and I think with COVID, I mean, I think that's a great example of really fixing the last mile, right? So we heard all these doses got to the states, but then there's just like, it just wasn't nailed down right, getting it, you know, actually into the patient's arm. So it's how do you how do you make sure that experience is seamless and enjoyable in order to create a stickiness with your customer base? So the last mile is all about the the engagement with the customer in this like in that example, right? So that's very interesting. So it's because it's seen by the customer, that's what they deem is the most important. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. It's like what you really remember. It's that last that mm. last piece of it. If you tell me I'm going to get something on Tuesday and I don't get it till Thursday, and it you know it ends up in a broken box and. Um, I have an unfriendly app experience, and that's that's what I'm gonna remember. It doesn't matter, really, you know. Yeah, that's so true because like we are, we've got such high expectations now, and if it's a day late, there's something wrong with the world. You know, people lose their minds now, right? Because we want it the same day or the next day. So um, that's very interesting. It makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so okay, so talk to me about reshoring. Oh, yeah, so reshoring is about um, bringing things domestically. And so you have seen a trend in the market around this. It's, you know, the idea is companies who have moved to offshore production now are seeing a lot of the risks that are in there. I mean, you could have trade wars, you could have increases in tariffs, and it just becomes a lot less predictable and controllable for businesses. And so in some instances, in order to have more control, it might make sense for you to move operations domestically. Um, you know, it is very complicated, though, because you have to make sure you have the right labor force, you have to make sure that you're you're doing kind of the right thing holistically. But, um, you know, making that decision may make the most sense, even though it could be an increase in cost, but long term, it's less risky and, and, and more stable for your business. And this is probably more, uh, my follow up question is probably a little bit more on the marketing side here. But do you think there's, um, with the customer demands, um, do you think they're expecting things to be generated from their own country now? Like, 
Do you think there's a perception happening in the world because of because of COVID and everything that's happening around the world? Do you think that people want to see homemade um, things like the USA here, right? Do people want to say made in the USA on their products? Or do you think that's sort of just a bit of an overreaction? Yeah, I, I do think it is a big thing. And, and maybe not just having things produced domestically, but, you know, supporting kind of local communities and having that more kind of bespoke experience. So, yeah. you know, natural, like my shoes are made out of recycled water bottles in the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think people are just more aware of kind of the environmental footprint. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's not necessarily like I need my products made in the USA, although, you know, I, I do feel good about supporting my country and my local economy. But it's also like if you think about producing offshore, too, it's that the, the the impact on the environment and transporting goods across the ocean and and just being more aware of your your carbon footprint I, I think the people are more conscious of that for sure yeah okay cool well thank you so i have one more question for you today and i ask it to all my guests is if anyone's listening to this let's hope let's hope there are right <laughs> the people listening to this um, what is the one thing that they should take away from this? What's the message you'd like to get out there um, about supply chain resiliency? <sighs> it's a tough. It's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my I think the big message here is, you know, the pandemic is an extreme circumstance. You can't really, you know, and hopefully we won't have to prepare for a global pandemic. In our, in our lifetimes again. So that's not really reasonable, either from a business setting or a personal setting, but things are changing. You know, the world, we're not gonna go back to the new, the old normal pre-COVID. And as things change, it's really an opportunity to, to do things better and smarter um, and to take that opportunity to, to really think about, you know, how you wanna manage your operations, um, in, in light of everything that we know now. So th that would be my takeaway. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Cause you, you got to think a lot of people would have been affected by COVID or, or the natural disa disasters we've seen recently. So assessing what you have and, and your operation and your processes, it's so important to stay flexible, right? So awesome. Well, listen, Elaine, thank you so much. This has been really fun. I, I actually learned a lot, which is a big plus for me. I like to I like to make sure that I'm, I'm growing every time I do one of these. So I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank you. No worries. Speak to you soon. You've been listening to Logic 2020's podcast, Digital Now. To learn more, visit our website at logic2020.com or follow us on social media. See you next time.